While the A-20 Havoc was living up to its name in the Pacific and Europe, Douglas was wondering what they could do now with the power of a fully operational military-industrial complex at their fingertips, now that America was fully at war and all restrictions beforehand had been repealed. It didn't take long for them to begin looking at the A-20 with ideas forming in their minds. In a predictable and somewhat ironic twist, their plans for improving the Havoc would essentially just boil down to making it bigger and giving it more capable equipment, now that the concerns about costs and previously unproven technologies were not a hindrance with the full might of the US industrial base. With breakthroughs in airfoil design, the application of laminar flow wings to a plane of this size was now practical and theoretically could allow the plane to reach incredible speeds. To power the aircraft and make it reach those speeds, Douglas selected the venerable and proven R-2800 Double Wasp from Pratt & Whitney. To cover the rear arc and defend the plane from smaller fighters, a daring solution was thought up with two remote turrets, one dorsal and one ventral, both mounted in the rear of the fuselage controlled by a single gunner, who used a periscope system linked to an analog computer for fire control. In practice, the complex periscope system that allowed for the gunner to operate both turrets was a nightmare to maintain, and in the frontline conditions, the system failed more often than not. For armament, an internal bomb bay and external mounts allowed it to carry up to 6,000 pounds of various ordnances, including bombs and rockets. In addition to general ordnance, the nose of the aircraft also had a unique feature in that it was modular, and allowed it to be replaced with one of two noses in but a matter of hours by ground crew. The first nose was the solid general purpose nose with 6 to 8 machine guns, or a smaller amount of 20mm or 37mm cannons. The other option was a glass bombardier nose which allowed the plane to operate as a precision tactical bomber with the aid of the Norden bomb site. These planes did not sacrifice forward facing armament however, and depending on the time frame, mounted either twin machine guns in the nose, or 6 machine guns mounted in the wings. First flown in July of 1942, the newly christened A-26 Invader would undergo some revisions, having to address some minor design flaws encountered during testing, before entering service with the USAAF in late 1943. However, it would take just short of an entire year before the Invader was operationally ready in any capacity, seeing its first debut in combat with the 3rd Bombardment Group of the 5th Air Force in the South Pacific. First combat trials, however, were not great, as an oversight with the visibility of the A-26 made it very difficult to actually perform accurate ground attack missions, so much so that the 3rd Bombardment Group just wanted their A-20s back. Off of this rocky start, the A-26 would later be sent to Europe to do medium bomber duties in place of the elder A-20s and Martin B-26s, where it performed marginally better, though suffered some heavy losses as these were the last days of German resistance with exceptionally heavy flak cover, even despite the pummeling the 8th Air Force had already given it. After a stint in both the Pacific and Europe, the Second World War would come to a close, and thus came a time of peace. Well, relative peace, anyway. With the end of World War II, the organization of the U.S. Air Force as its own independent branch separate from the Army, the A-26 would be renamed to B-26 in 1948, causing no end of confusion when someone tries to talk about the B-26 Marauder, with some mistaking the A-26 as the Marauder due to the shared designation. The invader's life would be fairly dormant until the Korean War broke out, where A-26s would then find themselves flying out of Japan against North Korean targets as a medium bomber, preying upon trains, trucks, and other logistical targets. The 452nd Bombardment Wing, the primary users of invaders during this time, would fly 15,000 sorties, 7,000 of which were at night, for the loss of 85 crewmen, around 30 aircraft worth. They flew sorties from 1950 to 1952 and achieved a final score of around 38,500 vehicles, 406 locomotives, and 3,700 railway trucks. These numbers are obviously rough estimates based upon claimed kills and should not be taken as concrete, as looking at just the 406 train score alone is just a little silly. Elsewhere, the A-26 would find itself in use by the French Air Force fighting against insurgents during the First Indochina War, though such use would be limited as Indochina quickly gained independence and formed the state of Vietnam, which we shall come back to. In Indonesia, an attempt to overthrow President Sukarno after he displayed communist leanings was attempted by the CIA, who borrowed A-26s and then gave them to the rebels against Sukarno. This attempt failed, however Indonesia was impressed by the A-26's performance and would order a few and use them all the way to 1977 in a surprising number of operations against rebel uprisings and, shortly before their retirement, the invasion of East Timor. Speaking of overthrowing communist leaders, the A-26 would be involved in the infamous Bay of Pigs invasion, where the CIA sponsored Cuban exiles to try and overthrow Fidel Castro. 
Cuban exiles would use, among other aircraft, the A-26 Invader painted in fake Cuban Air Force colors to support their landing, though this landing would end up being a colossal failure that would help fuel the tension during the Cuban Missile Crisis the next year. Returning to Vietnam as we said we would, in 1964 the Gulf of Tonkin incident brought U.S. forces into Vietnam and soon found themselves waging war against the North Vietnamese in a battle against communism. Despite being old, archaic, and with more advanced aircraft available for its role, the A-26 went anyway and would actually be among the first American aircraft to participate in the Vietnam War, being used in Operation Farmgate by the CIA to train the Republic of Vietnam Air Force in secrecy. After the U.S. entered Vietnam, the personnel and aircraft were integrated into the 1st Air Commando Squadron, who would inherit the A-26s and use them in counterinsurgency operations, among other roles, against the Viet Cong throughout the war. Early in its operations, however, the old age of the aircraft proved troublesome as the structural lifespans of airframes began to be exceeded. One notable instance occurred when the wing of an A-26 simply sheared off while the plane was pulling out of a dive, causing the entire fleet to be grounded while the cause was investigated. When it was found that the old wings were in dire need of replacement, having outlived their design service life by several years, the OnMarks Engineering Company, based out of California, was contracted to upgrade the A-26 and breathe new life into it. OnMarks Engineering was chosen specifically because the company had an exclusivity deal with Douglas at the time for the sale and manufacturing of A-26 parts for the civilian market, and knew how to work with the plane better than anyone else, including Douglas, who was at this time busy producing a good chunk of the Navy's aircraft registry, and busy working some financial difficulties that would end with it merging with McDonnell to form McDonnell Douglas in 1967. The Counter Invader, as it would be called, would culminate into the B-26K, which was renamed to A-26A due to politics regarding Thailand at the time not allowing American bombers to operate off of its airfields. How a simple rename allows the same aircraft to operate off of the same airfield is known only to those who can understand the mess of politics that is the Vietnam War. The primary feature of the refit included remanufactured wings to increase the service life of the airframe, wingtip fuel tanks for extended range, newer models of the Pratt & Whitney R2800 for more power and more available spare parts, more efficient propellers, and lastly, improved brakes to better cope with the runways it would be using. Two of these counter-invaders would be chosen for Operation Shedlight, a crash program to develop technologies and tactics for using aircraft in night or adverse weather. The counter-invaders' involvement was to be the testbed for a prototype FLIR system called Lonesome Tiger. However, when the system was tested on the aircraft, it proved unsatisfactory results, with the FLIR system suffering heavily in the climate of Vietnam, and the aircraft itself not lending well to the integration of the system. Counter invaders would continue to fly until 1969 when they were retired due to reaching the safe flying limits for their airframes, having quite literally flown the plane to the breaking point. With their retirement in 1969 would come the end of the A-26's usage in the USA, but before that time, A-26's would be used elsewhere in the world such as the Portuguese colonial wars by the Portuguese Air Force in 1965, as well as the Democratic Republic of the Congo during the Congo Crisis in support of the Dragon Operations, both times serving as a counterinsurgency platform that it had grown to be quite proficient in. Two A-26s would also ironically find themselves on the other side of their counterinsurgency role in 1967 during the Nigerian Civil War, when Biafra attempted to break away and form its own independent state. This event is notable as the commander of Biafra's Air Force was one Jan Zumbak, a former member of the famous No. 303 Squadron of the RAF. Jan had somehow made it a pastime of commanding the air forces of breakaway African nations, having done so similarly during the Congo crisis with the breakaway state of Katanga. He would then embrace his status as a real-life ace combat protagonist when he organized and commanded the Biafran Air Force, flying an A-26 all the while. He would surprisingly survive both ordeals and die in 1986 in suspicious circumstances, possibly alluding to a government-sanctioned assassination. With its wartime service done, the A-26 would continue flying in commercial and private hands. Two uses for the civil invader would become popular, with the first being executive personnel transport for ferrying VIPs at high speeds in the days before jet travel or purpose-built executive aircraft. The second use was as a water bomber for firefighter services, who were happy to get anything with wings that could drop lots of water at high speed. OnMark Engineering would provide, with some help early on by Grand Central Aircraft, spare parts for the Invader all the way to sometime around the mid-1960s. In total, Douglas Aircraft would produce 2,503 Invaders, with OnMark converting 41 of those aircraft into the Counter Invader, and another 8 into their Executives, Marketeers, and Marksman Executive Transport Aircraft. 
Out of all of these, 99 invaders exist worldwide, with the vast majority of them housed in the USA, with a good handful being airworthy thanks to Onmarks, who, while having gone defunct sometime in the 70s, allowed a supply of spare parts to exist longer than it frankly had any right to, meaning that in the modern day it's easier to locate leftover spare parts from that supply than it is to find, say, spare parts for an A-20. In regards to air shows, which they would show up to with regularity, the A-26 is also responsible for why passengers are not allowed to fly on planes during air displays in the UK, as an A-26 crashed in 1980 during the Biggin Hill Air Show due to pilot error. The Civil Air Authority introduced rules and regulations after the accident preventing passengers from being on board during air displays in response to this tragedy. In the world of film, the A-26 would make one notable appearance, being the star aircraft of Steven Spielberg's Always, a film regarding the aerial firefighters and the risks they face every day. Flying alongside a supporting cast of B-25 Mitchells and PBY Catalinas, just to name a few. And that, finally, concludes the surprisingly long and storied history of The Invader. From a rocky start as a medium bomber to beloved ground attacker, to a dusty old counterinsurgency platform given new life, and even flying on the sides of the insurgents in the case of Biafra and Katanga, this plane flew for a lot longer than I bet anyone, even Douglas, expected it to. And I believe that the reason it flew for so long as it did is, well, part of why the A-20 was so beloved. Simplicity. The A-26 Invader was a simple plane, discounting the rear turret amalgamation, much like its older brother with a good airframe, mounting good engines, and providing good performance. Combine that with a bit of luck in the form of Onmark's life extension plan, and you've got the recipe for a plane that can serve for a little under 30 years, as everything from the CIA's favorite disposable rebel plane to Special Operations Squadron's premier truck hunter. <laughs>